بسم الله والحمد لله وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا الكريم وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته السلام SCI Phoenix, I mean, State Correctional Institute, uh, Institution of Phoenix. And today, inshallah ta'ala, and in the future we're going to talk about the legacy that these two men, amongst others, started uh, in the, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections as far as establishing Islam. So welcome, my dear guests and sheikhs, sheikhs. Hood and Sheikh Saeed. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I'd like for you guys to introduce yourselves. I'm Hood Abdul Kabir. I'm um, almost 83 and I've been Muslim since um, 1972. What control took all black Saeed? When you say Muslim, you mean during that time, you came directly to the Sunnah. Yes. No nation of Islam, anything. Oh, no, no. Always Sunnah. Right. Good, good question. Mm -hmm. Good, excellent question. Oh. They got to be known. Right. I'm going to that one my brother. Yeah. Um, and you want to, uh, Sheikh, you want to um, uh, tell the people about your name before you became Muslim? You know, who you, what your name is and... Okay, I was born Hugh Sinclair Williams. Mm -hmm. And I've been rolling with that name ever since mm -hmm. I took Shahada, which was in 1972. Right. Where are you from? I'm from Philadelphia. Uh, what part? West Philly. West Philly. So what neighborhood did you grow up in? What neighborhood? Mm -hmm. Well, what we call the bottom. Uh -huh. That was about 42nd, 41st in uh, Manchester. Okay. What was it like back then? Well, it was very, very calm compared to that. Uh, you got to remember, uh, I was born uh, before World War II. So when the war was over with, I was, what, four or five years old, something like that. Uh, and I witnessed a lot of soldiers that had fought in the war come home and so forth. So I had. I had first-hand knowledge of all my uncles and so forth, except one was in the, was in the military. Uh -huh. And at that time, you got to remember, we're talking about the 40s now, we're not talking about today. Right. There were very few cars on the street, very few people. It was, different, it was altogether a different world than what we see now. Right. Uh, kids playing on the sidewalk and so forth. We had curfew. We had a lot of things that were imposed on, by our parents. You know, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't run wild, you know, right. he had to be within earshot. Right. So when it, when it, when it came time to, to, to go in, you heard the mothers call your name out, and you better be within hearing distance or you had a problem. Right. So it was a lot different than it is now. Uh, there were very few cars, very few telephones, no TV, we just had radio. Right. That was, that was the going thing. Uh -huh. See, so, and kids dressed a certain way. You could not wear certain things unless you were a certain age. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I would say, I couldn't wear a belt until I was about eight or nine years old because that was considered to be grown. Wow. I had to wear a snake, I had to wear what we call suspenders. Uh -huh. When we went to school, we went to school in short pants and so forth. We didn't wear long pants. Long pants was for Sunday or holidays. Wow. Other than that, you wore shorts. Right. And the little girls wore scarves and they wore bobettes in their hair and all like that. Mm -hmm. See, so it's a lot different than it is now. So we came up under the old school, what we what we would call our old school, which would be our fathers and our grandfathers, aunties and things of that right. nature. That would that were like born and raised like right after like maybe during the civil not civil war but the uh, first
First World War, something right. like that, around that time. Right. So we had a strict code. You know, kids were seen and not heard. Mm. That's something. Right. See, so it's different. I came up under a regiment. So we, we had discipline. We had manners. We had a protocol. And we, we, we although we, we were kids, we had our thing, but a kid was a kid. How about the family structure back then? What did it consist of, mainly? Well, I have uh, uh, three brothers and one sister. And mom and pop. Now they thought out when I was about like 12 years old. But primarily, I was raised in, in a, a dual family. A, a dual family. What about the neighborhood? Did most kids grew up in a two-family home in the neighborhood. Most of everybody that I know of had moms and dads. You know, right. there was very few people that didn't have a mom and dad. <laughs> what year did you start um, school? And what's the name of the school you went to? I went to Belmont for we first in uh, Brown. Uh -huh. That's what you saw, the elementary school. Yeah, too bright. Uh, what type of student were you in school? I would say maybe a little bit above average. Uh, B, a little B, maybe B plus, something uh, like that. Uh, what subjects did you excel in and why? I was always uh, mechanically inclined. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I love science. I love science. Uh, and uh, so I was always tinkering with things here and there, and uh, the only problem I had, like most people, I had a little trouble with math. I had a little trouble with math and so forth, but uh, once I learned it, I learned it, but it just took me a little while to, to really grasp what was going on. What year did you start elementary school? Oh, I guess 19, I guess uh, 1946, I guess. Wow. So around there. 1946. Yeah. Right. I didn't go to kindergarten. I went to straight through first grade. Right. So, um, what high school did you go to? I went to West Philly. West Philly High School. What year did you start? 1955. Okay. So, was there a change in that part of Philly from the early 40s into the 50s? Because now we're talking about the World War II vets came in. Um, did the drug scene start picking up the alcohol scene? What Or did it pretty much stayed the same. Oh no, that was that was uh barn. Mm -hmm. no, we mm -hmm. we didn't we didn't have that when I was a kid. No. In fact, uh, I remember a few occasions when I went out shopping with my mom or my dad or something like that. We would see a guy, uh, he'd be like sitting slumped over and the word was that he must be on drugs. That was it. Or alcohol. That was wow. it. And we would go around him. It was just, it was a thing where that was like a shame temple type thing. Mm. See, so we didn't we didn't have uh, that kind of problem. Right. See, every every I remember when I was younger, my dad used to take me to the beer garden and so forth, and well, you know, he was showing me off because I was the oldest boy, mm. and uh, so he was that's my son here and so forth, so forth, and all like that, and I, I hung out with him mm -hmm. like on the weekend particularly. But uh, it, it's, it's a marked difference between now and then. I mean, right. it, it just, it's like light and day. Right. We had, as I got older, you said, now you mentioned high school. When we got older, they, they had a curfew. If you were under 18, you had to be off the streets by 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. And if you were eight, and, and on the weekend to 12 o'clock. But at that time, there wasn't very many places kids could go. He either went to the movies, or we, or we had a place, at, the, at that time we had uh, Woodside Park, which is something like Coney Island, something like that. And we went to uh, where Carmen, where Carmen uh, Skating Rink, and something like that. And maybe it's swimming, that's it. Kid, you know, kids didn't have very much to do. Right. We had chores. Right. We had chores to do. We had to, take out the trash and the garbage and we had to clean the streets clean and all that. We didn't have a lot of out of time. We had time to be kids, but we also had chores. We had responsibilities. Right. So at at uh, at particularly summertime, we had gas lights on a block. We didn't have the electric light they got now. We had gas lights. And when that gas light came on, it was time to be home. And you could hear 
they would come on and then we would all break and come home. And uh, after that, you went to bed. Right. And then, like, as I got older, and to run high school, like I said, we had to be off the street at uh, 10 o'clock mm. during the week. Right. So the only places that we could really go was, like, house parties. And they were over at, like, 11 o'clock, maybe 11.30, because we had to be off the street by 12. Uh -huh. So it wasn't very many places we could go and wasn't that many places, things to do. Right. So we had a, a pretty pretty structured life. It was comfortable. When I think about it, it wasn't bad at all. Right. You know, when you're a kid, you, you want to move around a little more. But as I look at it now, it was it was beautiful. Did you play sports? What we now. <coughs> Did you play sports? I, I, the only sport, <coughs> the only sport that I uh, participated in on team level was I ran cross country. Okay. But uh, I was too light to play football. I'm not tall. I can't play basketball. <laughs> I couldn't play football. It was too light. Right. But, uh, and I can't really run fast. I, I, I can run, run long distance, but I can't run fast. And uh, so I, I went ahead and I joined the, um, I joined a team and ran cross country, which, which at that time was like basketball is now. Basketball was, was a good sport to play and watch, but for some reason in Philadelphia, cross country was, the, was really a sport. Interesting, wow. And every, all the schools got together on Friday, and uh, we ran around to, uh, let me see, 33rd and Ridge, mm -hmm. to the reservoir. We ran around that like one time, mm -hmm. and uh, that, was, that was a big thing. So, was it a lot of uh, racism you experienced coming up? Well, actually, when I was coming up, the, the neighborhoods were like white and black, uh -huh. you know. And slowly but surely, they began to, to change from from all nearly all white to brown to, you know, like that. So, you um, grew up in an integrated neighborhood? Yeah. Uh -huh. all, all my schooling. When I went, when I went to Belmont, it was half white, half black. When I went to Salzburger Junior High, half white, half black. And when I went to uh, West Philly, it was half white, half black. Except when we graduated, it was more black than white. Ah, uh because -huh. right. they started the... Right, so they had so-called white flight. Right, right. You started to see it. Right, so, so we saw it all. So you're talking about uh, 1960? You started high school in 1955? 50, yeah. So by the time you got to the late 50s, early 60s, you started to see the change in... Well, I saw I saw it in in high school. Uh -huh. from, from high school, you saw. Like I said, when we when I first went to West Philly, it was like half white, half black. Mm -hmm. By the time I graduated, it was all it was like three quarters black and one quarter white. Right. So I saw all that. Right. And then we saw the changes of uh, personnel when I was younger. We saw the changes in. Like the trashmen, mm -hmm. the trash, the trash guys used to. A lot of times they were white. They had black guys with them, but the white guys drove. Mm -hmm. They drove, and then we we saw as the thing began to change, we saw more and more blacks driving, and we saw what the whites, what they had so-called white flight. They all left, and went, went wherever they went. Right. So you look around there, all of a sudden, all the male men were were, were black, basically. All the chaff men were white, all the garbage men were white, mm -hmm. I mean black rather. We saw, we saw all this thing, it was just it was a gradual thing. Right. It was a gradual thing. Sheikh Saeed, introduce yourself to the audience. Okay, my name is um, Saeed Abdul Haaland. I took that name in 1971. I was born by the name of Robert Jordan. I was born in 1941 at Harlem Hospital in New York City. And I only lived there for about a year before we moved to Philadelphia. So your, your family's originally from New York? Your yes. mom and dad? No, all of them. Really? All my brothers. All my brothers, sisters were born in New York, except my two youngest. Uh -huh. And we moved to, um, I thought I'm from the old Harlem Hospital. On oh, 35th Street? Now. This is the one in New York now, the new one. Right. It was old. I think it was on 133rd Street. Right. You know? 
Anyway, I said, well, it's very cool being a must. But um, we moved to Philadelphia when I was one years old and we moved to North Philly, which is only lived there for a couple of years, and then we moved to South Philly. Uh, a section called the, the Tasker, a, a Grace Ferry area. A great, a around 20, 28 and Tasker all around there. Uh, right, matter of fact, right where it's all there now. Mm -hmm. Anyway, move around there. My, my upbringing is, is completely different from his. Because my, me growing up from my early teens, I was always in the streets. And I've been going to, I've been, I probably, I'm 81 years old now. I was born September 6, 1941. And most of my life I've been in jail. Most of it. I did two bits in Jersey. This bit right here, I've been down for 52 years. I first went to jail in 1957. That was a correction. I first went to my, my first long bit was in Camp Hill. It was a juvenile joint back in 1959. I went there, stayed there for 19 months. But okay, before you get into that, tell us about your early childhood. When yeah. did you go to elementary school? And okay, this, tell us, yeah. this, is all, this is all part of my early childhood. Cause I was, I was 14, 15, 16 years old then. Mm. I, I went this. I started going to. I started going to uh, school in 1948, and it's an amazing thing. Cause I didn't know all this back then, but I look back on a lot of things now. See, I, was, I grew up with a lot of history. I don't want to make no racial thing, but I grew up. In a so called environment where I seen a lot of history made in the United States. I was on the scene when the, the, the Brown versus Board of Education was uh, finalized in 1954, the whole civil rights movement. I was, uh, because my family originally is from down south, down Virginia, about 35 miles outside of Richmond. And my mother, used to, my, mother started, my mother and father started sending me down. South started about 1949, all the way to 1957 when I became my middle teens, right? I began to be, be more independent of my family and whatnot. At that time, I began, I began to get more wild in the streets and whatnot, and I'd be joining, I was more than joining the gang, I was a part of the gang and whatnot. What was, what was um, part of the, what were some of the, the, the gangs in South Philly at the time? At that time, at that time, I wouldn't, the bad time I moved to West Philly. Okay. I moved to West Philly in 1955. Cause the projects we grew up in in South Philly, they tore it down. It was called the old League Island Projects. And all that, all that's around 33rd, Task of 33rd, they tore it down. We moved, moved to West Philly in 1955. So you were about 14. I was 14 years old. Exactly. <clears throat> and the gang I was in, back then was a, a gang called the Bobby Coats. Was around 57, a little all around 60, the market all around here, right? Uh, and I've been going to jail ever since then because I did time in Jersey. I did two bits over there. I think I maxed out over there in 1966. I first got locked. I got first got locked up in Camden in 1962 for a robbery, and it gave me five years. But I did about two years in that at the deck of the time. Thing over there is different. But I want to say something about that every time. It's very, very important. Because when I first started going to jail during a real long time in Jersey, remember now I'm from Philadelphia. If I went to Jersey, I started meeting people from all over Jersey, North New Jersey, Camden, and they were the first one to just start turning me on to different types of things about life, about oppression, about slavery, things that were in vogue back then, right? Mm -hmm. Black power, things like all things that was in power at that time, back in the early sixties and whatnot. I met a I met a lot of a lot of my mentors at that time came out of North New Jersey, right? 
So, well, I, the first time I left, I left in 19, I, I went home in 1963. How old, how old were you when you did your first bid? Oh, I was uh, 18 years old. 18. Went to White Hills. It's called Camp Hill. It's called Camp Hill now. It's called White Hills. It was a juvenile joint back then. Yeah. Pay attention now. What was it like? Yeah, be rough. How was, how was the penitentiary? It had to be tough. Juvenile joints are way worse than the, 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 the uh, adult penitentiary because the, the, the youth are brutal and don't have no, they live long to have no wisdom there. Right. You know, so they, they are real brutal. Back then it was much more outward, you know, rape. <laughs> and all the bitches things you, you see in jail. Uh, that's another whole story in itself. Right. So I'm going to get to, because I'm <laughs> sidetracked. But I want to say that when I first met a lot of these brothers out of um, Jersey, right? They were the first ones to turn me on too. Like, you know, different types of struggle in the world, uh, different types of uh, social aspects of, of life and whatnot. This is when I began to do a lot of reading, because I've always been an avid reader, right? Mm -hmm. My whole life. I've always been a person that learned. You asked her the question well, a while ago, what was he good in school then? My thing. I've always loved politics. I've always loved science. I've always loved, um, you know, uh, natural things. I first heard of Islam in 1957. I didn't pay no mind. So as kids, you really didn't. No. Uh -huh. No, because that's who said earlier. Well, I went to uh, uh, second. I'm not uh, anybody in school. I went to Lord and Reed. Lord and Reed. Lord and Reed. That's a that's a that's a junior high school in South Philly. Uh -huh. And it was black and white. I'm gonna tell you something that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. When I went to elementary school around there, I went to James Alco Elementary School, which is right across from where we I recall how they taught us. And a lot of people talk about slavery, history, then I live a lot of that stuff. Because they taught us in school. It was a book by Little Black Sambo and Tar Baby and Living Bright Living Color. I've seen no Bob Brady. I was too young to understand because I was 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, then, right? But I, I, something in me knew it wasn't right, but I didn't know what it was. Nothing about no racism. Uh -huh. These were in the textbooks. These are textbooks. Yeah. These are books they handed out in school. Mm -hmm. this, is, this was an integrated school. Right. And they gave these books out to everybody. I recall the pictures in the books. A little, a little black tar baby running around, running around a, a lion and turning the butter and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, uh, you know what I'm saying? You remember them books, right? Yeah, I remember. And they display towards in school. So this is the kind of environment I grew up in in the late 19th. Remember, this is late 40s. Right. Early 50s and whatnot. Did right? your dad, was he, um, or any of your, your family members, did they go fight in World War II? No, my father, not that I know of, he, he didn't fight in the war. My father was always, he worked down Western House. Uh -huh. That's a, that was a big company out there in Chester, Pennsylvania, right? He, worked, he, was, a, he was a forklift operator. And my mother, she was a regular housewife, right? But... So you grew up in a two-parent home? Yes. So the neighborhood that you lived in, most of the kids in the neighborhood had... Everybody. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Basically, things were what we were called... The streets were there, but everything, it was still old-fashioned. Still old-fashioned. The, the fights didn't work. The, the fights did the most. We had a little gun, but not the kind of firepower they had today. Right. And the dudes today, we had a thing called fair ones. You got to you fight a guy one on one. Right. See what I'm saying? Right. And neither of used more than guns back then. Right. And so, the, so, res mm, the sorry, respect uh -huh. the people had back then was, was monumental. They had respect. Blacks right. respected each other. Right. So. <clears throat> What year did you start school, elementary I, school? So elementary school, I started about nine, I, I born in 41, so it had to be around about 1948, 19, 49, 1948, yeah. 49. Right. And this is all in South Philly? All in South Philly. So what junior high school did you go to? I went to Ordinary. Uh-huh. Ordinary Junior High, I went to, I went to 
James Alcorn Elementary School, down with the Lord Reed, up until the ninth grade, that's when we moved to West Philly, and the last grade, I went to ninth grade. What school Sarah, was that? Sarah Junior High School. Uh-huh. And then I went to West Philly High, same high school we went to. But I got kicked out in 1958. 1958, wow. I kicked out from carrying a gun. Uh-huh. Right? Well, it was a zip gun, you know, but it was a gun. Right. You know. So, that's when I really started my street life. Uh-huh. Right? Back in the 50s when I started, I was in my teens and when I started going to jail. So, but before we talk about your incarceration, mm -hmm. paint a picture for us of the the street life back then as far as the gang. What were some of the the major gangs in Philadelphia? Well, most, the of the, most of all parts of the city had major gangs. Uh -huh. South Philly, they had Carpenter Street, 5th Street, 13th Street, the road, and I grew up down the road, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, North Philly had the village, the valley, they had the Tenor Line, they had Morocco, they had uh, a lot of other gangs, uh, Cyber Street, uh, West Philly had the Black Bottom, where he grew up at, the top, by the coast, 60th Street, the moon, places like that, right? Uh -huh. The bars and all them from here. Yeah. Right. So, <coughs> the, the gangs back then, they were vicious, but see, you gotta understand, the social, structure done changed so much in the last 50, 55 years that you wouldn't recognize it because Hood said something earlier about, when I got locked up, there wasn't no color TV. There mm -hmm. wasn't no internet. There wasn't no, there wasn't no, um, uh, 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 uh. there was no technology. Mm -hmm. There wasn't nothing. There wasn't no cell phones. Right. There was no technology. When I first had a TV, my first color TV, I got that in 1985. <laughs> right? Wow. So when you got caught with the um, with the gun charge back in 1958, yeah, were you incarcerated for that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But see, back then they didn't get a kind of time again. You know, a juvenile, right? A juvenile. Right. So I went to jail. I went to right over 19 months. Mm -hmm. You know, let you out. Right. And you didn't have no long parole tales, and you didn't have to. You know, they, they, they couldn't put you back in jail right away. Right. You know what I'm saying? I first, I first, my first bit was in the House of Correction. That was in 1957. Mm -hmm. At that time, there was drugs on the scene, but not like it is now. Right. Well, I, was smoking, I was smoking weed back in, back in the 50s. You can call, sir. You know, things like that, right? So I knew about weed and cocaine and stuff like that, but not to the extent that they had today, right? Mm -hmm. That everybody used, everybody get high, right? Right. And the matter of fact, the, the society addicted people to drugs today, purposely, right, just to make money. Right. But back then, the major drug that was the worst drug of all was heroin. Right. The cocaine was only for like people who had the money to buy that, and they hadn't reached that hadn't reached epidemic proportion proportions like they do today. Right. And all that new stuff they got there, like fentanyl, all that stuff, we even heard of back then, right? Right. You know, so I stayed high. Huh? Cause I love to stay high. Mm. I smoke weed, man, since I was 14, 15 years old. And I, that's when I learned, well, I got into jazz a lot. Uh -huh. I was a deep jazz African idol, right? So I knew, I used to go to the concerts and buy all the of jazz co collection, man, of some of the most rarest albums in, in, in the United States. Really? Billy, Billy Holiday stuff from 1933, mm. all that kind of stuff, you know right. what I mean? I was into that, all that, right? But that's, Side travel, right. right? So, during this time, we're talking about the late 50s. Yes. So, you get Late 50s, early 60s. Early 60s. So, yeah. Okay. I said, well, well, I got locked up for my first bit in 1957. We beat up a school official, mm. right? In San Junior High School. They sent me to the House of Correction for six months. Then, when I got out of there, we got locked up for some gang activity. In Kyle's Creek in 1959. That's when they took me, that's when they sent me to, that was my first bit. That was in 1959. I went to, to Canville, or what we call the White Hill back then. It was so, the White Hill for 1959, and I got out in 1960. So, what was it like, um, your first bid being sent all the way out to Camp Hill? Um, what kind of adjustment was that for you? Well, it was, it, was, it was an adjustment because it was my first bit. Right. And, 
was a rough joint. Because those juvenile joints back then, the two major juvenile joints back then was Glen Mills and Camp and White Hill, right? I went to White Hill because I was, I was 17 years old, right? So when I went there, I never really had no problem. I never had, I never had problem in jail. I was like a little tough guy, like a little runner on the corners and all that. So, because I knew all the, I knew all, most of all the major gang leaders all across the city. Because I used to go all over the city, North Wing, South Wing, West Wing, mm -hmm. chasing the girls, drinking, getting high, things like that, drinking, right. things like that. The street life. Right. Remember I said earlier, I was in that street life for a long time. I was in that street life since I was 14 years old. Right. See what I'm saying? So, I met a lot of guys who ran those gangs back then. You know? Like Tall High. Mm -hmm. I didn't meet him, but I, I knew all his old heads and all that. Right. Since I knew all them, I knew all his people. Right. You know, back then. Right. Even though I never, I didn't know, I didn't meet him in 1975. Right. So, understanding jail back then is understanding a whole new, uh, at the time there wasn't no rights. Nobody had no rights. Mm -hmm. The whole was the whole. These holes were there like penthouses. The whole back then was whole. They thought it was, they thought it was an empty cell, take your matches off and that's it. So what would it be like? No, the no running water. Homebird didn't have no running water. You got your water, you got your hot water out the shower every night before you locked up, and they had a, a spigot in the cell that had, had cold water. So it wasn't no hot water. Mm -hmm. You you didn't have no laundry. Wash your own clothes and put them on paper on the bed. That's how they pressed them out. So they said, other words, the jail for primitive. Right. When I first up, when the first. One of, the, one of the early jails at the time, in, like in 1962, was a place called Moy Mess or Moco. That was on uh, down South Philly. We had to, we, we watched movies, and had to put up sheets between the tiers for the screen. That's how primitive them joints was. You know what I'm one thing I be known, was a lot of homosexuality back then. A lot of forced homosexuality. If you was weak and joined back then, you better have a problem. Cause one no pity, one no mercy. Juvenile joints are always worse than adult joints because adults they have a little more experience about life. Adults, uh, youth, they just deal with pure brutality. Right. So how do you uh, view the youth now and the violence that's going on in Philadelphia? Is this anything new to you, or do you feel that it's a big difference from the time it's a, you grew it's up? It's a complete, it's a different, it's a, it's a, it's a, a nuclear distance between, between night and day. Mm -hmm. see, Which the, way? How see is the, it different now than? Because of just the sheer animalistic brutality. Uh -huh. See, when I was growing up, hood to, we were brutal, right? But we weren't sadistic. And it was there was a certain kind of social rule you just abide by. You never kill nobody in front of their mother. You never kill children. You never kill women. Uh -huh. These days, they, 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 I'm going to use a term, I don't want to use it, but it's the only term I can use to try to describe what I'm talking about. These dudes are there animalistic. Right. Simple as that. They, they, these, dudes are, these dudes are savages. Right. For real, I mean, I mean real savages. Right. You may not like to be called that because you take that slavery thing somewhere else, but these dudes are savages. You didn't do that stuff when I was going around. Right. So what would you, before we close out this session, what would you advise the youth, both of you, what, what would you advise the youth okay. advise? There's nothing can change the youth today except Islam. Right. The practice of Islam. Right. I don't mean just lip service because there's a thousand of them out there. There's a lot of Muslims out there, right. but they're doing the same thing the Catholics are doing. Right. They're doing the same thing that the, that the unrestrained people are doing. Right. The only thing that can change the youth today is Islam that's being practiced in the correct Islam. Right. I'm going to make something very, very plain to um, the people who we be talking to. Me in the hood, right? There was nobody our age who didn't come up in the nation of Islam. The nation of Kufa. Really, right? We bypassed that. And we went through hell, not grateful for, for, 
three or four years. Because right. that time, there was a dominant group in the jail, right? And they ran rush out over everybody. They was killing guys and whatnot. I mean, real killers and whatnot. And we, we, were so, we were so many Muslims, and I was the man at that time down there after I left, broke up, or after I left Hood in them, right? Mm -hmm. So, Sheikh Hood, could you tell me the next major transition in your life? So now we're about 1958, and I know the whole political scene is changing demographics and South Phil uh, Philadelphia and all urban areas right, right. during that time. Um, you, you're coming to your own now, you're 18 years old. So what was the next major transition in your life? Well, one of the things that uh, I had to get used to was being grown. Mm. See, because before, you know, you, you depended on your parents and so forth. But I started working and so forth. And I had to learn how to bu uh, budget my money, mm. how to pay, pay my way. You know, so that was a, a, a big and significant change in my life because everything depended on myself as opposed to my parents and so forth. But uh, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. It was a, a natural transition that everybody was supposed to go through. Uh, I worked and I started getting laid off like a lot of other people. And I had to transition, but well, what do you do when you get laid off? You know, you, you're paying your parents a uh, rent and so forth. Now you got to really budget your money and, and so forth. And I, I kept going back and forth with a different little job and so forth until I went to the military. What year was this? That was 1961. 1961. And I stayed in the uh, military for, uh, let me say, four months. No, no. Four years and nine months. I went to the Air Force, and one of the reasons why I went was because my uncles had been in the Navy and the Army during World War II and Korea. The youngest, the youngest uncle, he's about like maybe nine years or so older than me. So anyway, <clears throat> anyway, um, I decided to go to the Air Force because it was something different. I said the Navy didn't didn't uh, enthuse me. And the army, I know what to do with that. And I you went have to Force. have good grades to get in the Air Force. Right oh there? yeah, yeah, yeah. Take a test. Uh, at that time, the Air Force was kind of elitist. And that's not like it is now. You had to take a test. Right. And uh, if you didn't take, a, if you didn't pass that test, you didn't get inducted. So during the time that I was in the uh, Air Force, I was really the only black guy in a lot of areas. So I went to school, I was the only, only black guy in the barracks of 72 in basic. When I graduated from basic, I went to um, tech school, become an aircraft mechanic. I was the only guy, only black guy in that outfit. Then when I transferred from so there. So where did you go? What, well, I was in, uh, well, all this Station. took place in uh, Texas. Texas? Yeah, I was in, I was stationed, I, was, I went to Lackland first. For basic, and then I went to Wichita Falls, Texas, for schooling. Then I got transferred to my uh, permanent base, which is Oklahoma. So now you're talking about the early '60s. Right. You're in Texas. What was that like for you coming from Philly? Oh, well, it was it was it was a, a huge wake up because the the racism that was prevalent in the North was subtle. In the South, it was outright. So here, here we couldn't, or we weren't allowed to, or we weren't supposed to be in certain neighborhoods. I'll give you a good example. Now, a lot of the young guys right now that say they're from Oak Lane, West Oak Lane, Germantown, Mount Airy, back in the day, brother, the only, only black folks that was in that area there where, where our mothers and our aunts and uncles and so forth that did day's work. They did day's work. They would be out there on the corner in the morning and the cars would drive up and they would pick who they wanted to, to go to their houses and help clean up. See, so guys now think that blacks always lived in the area. No, they didn't. They did not live in the area. They, you might have walked through there on the way to work or something like that, but you didn't hang out. And you better not be caught <laughs> after a certain time of, time of day. Because mm -hmm. that's the way it was. Right. 
Now in the South, you know, very segregated, you had your, what you call the flats or across the tracks. That's where most people live. I think Chicago probably is about the best city in the North that will give you an idea. When they say the East Side, they mean the East Side. They're talking about all the East Side is predominantly black or brown, and the other side is predominantly white, whatever this might be. Now in the South, across the tracks meant that was the black side of town, or, or the flats, depending on where you live at. And depending on people in South, people in South Carolina, it might be called a flats. Right. And Oklahoma might be called a you know, cross the tracks. But it was usually always near train, train tracks, mm. to tell you true. And uh, I had to get used to uh, not going certain places at certain times. I'll give a good example now. Like I said, when I was in the barracks uh, in, 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 in uh, Texas, I, I'm the only black guy. So there wasn't no, no place else to hang out but with the white guy. I had no problem with it, I went to school with white guy. Right. But um, when it came time to go to town, you know, they went their way and I had to go my way. See, because you, you, can't, you can't be on the white side of town. That, and a lot of times when say in Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas and you know, Missouri, they are on what you call central time. At 12 o'clock, the TV went off. That was it. Because yeah, there were people farmers and so forth, or they, uh, light industry. Right. Now, what happened was uh, at 12 o'clock, all the white bars and clubs and all like that closed. So the white guys, they wanted some place to go. But on the black side of town, it was still jumping up and down. Right. <laughs> so they want to come on there. So. He said, no, man, you can't, you can't come in this area. Why, why are you feeling as though you, you, you got the right to come over here? We can't go where you go. Right. Oh, we the same guy. We we on the same flag, you know, we blah, blah, blah. All that kind of rap. And it was true. Right. But when you think about it, they were trying to get two bites of the apple, so right. to speak. Right, right. So most couples jump off every now and then. So and you remember seeing uh, Signs at the Water Fountain? And bathrooms. Oh yeah, you remember seeing that stuff? Oh, I, I lived it. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you what happened. Uh, when I transferred from Lackland to Richtal Falls, there's something like um, oh maybe about seven eight busloads of us. We all graduated from basic, and we were going to tech school. Mm. And we I can't remember. I, I think it might have been Midland, Texas. I think it was Midland, Texas. So we rolled up in the parking lot and the buses started unloading. And uh, so when I got out the bus, I went to the, a, a restaurant or a hotel that they had rented, the airport they had rented. So we, this was a pit stop. We were going to eat and so forth, rest up a little bit. So now when I get to the door, I look and I say, wow. I can't go in there. I mean, check it. I, I realize where I'm at. So I leave and I go back and I sit in the bus. So uh, one of the guys that uh, was, uh, his name was Tim, his Dean rather, and another guy by the name of Tench, they lived in Coastville. Well, Coastville was where my mother and my, all my aunts and my family lived there. And I lived there for about a year or so. So anyway, they said, where are you going out here by yourself? Come on, get something to eat. I said, man, I'm in Texas, man. I said, I can't go in there. Go in there. Got these white women there serving us. I said, you think that's going to happen? He said, no, you can come in. I said, no, I ain't, I'm not going to start no trouble. Right. So I'm sitting there, and uh, so one of the sergeants came out, and he said, look, uh, I understand your, your situation. He said, look, in here, in this little hotel, you're one of the gang. You're going to be served with no problem. He said, now I can't speak for what happens after that, but right in here you can. So I go in the little spot, I sit down, and I hear this little black girl come over here, what you want? And he served me. And I said, it took, it took me out because outside of that, wasn't nothing else happening. Wow. So I sat there and I ate and all that. I wasn't comfortable because, like I say, I'm like the flying ointment and so forth. So when we got done, uh, we decided, well, we're going to go to this spot 
and I caught speed. It was a little grocery store or something like that. And we we're going to uh, buy some magazines because we got a long way to go. So you know, I'll get some magazines and so forth. So I go in and uh, start picking the magazine up, start looking at it. And the, the, page, uh, the guy that owned the spot, he told me, uh, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm buying some magazines. I'm just look, going through and see what I want. So he tells me that if I pick it up, I got to buy it. I said, what? He said, yeah, you, you got to buy it. I said, well, what if I don't want to read it? He said, I'm telling you that you got to buy it to pick it up. So I'm, for now, I'm saying, what, what, what's going to happen next? Believe it or not, some of the guys that I was living in the barracks with kind of started with him. Because I'm looking around like, this, this guy going to move on me or something? And uh, they were like, yeah, well, you've got to follow the script. So now i got an attitude with them and him. I'm about ready to, I'm about ready to show up. I'm young. I don't put on about 25 pounds. I'm in good shape. Uh, I, I can handle myself. These country boys can't handle me. That's what I'm thinking. So I said, no, nah, I, better, I better fall back. So I bought a few magazines and so forth. And we got on the bus and we rode. Then um, we went to the camp. And I, I signed in and so forth. Now here I am again, the only black guy in this, this situation. They put me in the room, we had a, a, a room where three guys could, could, could lock together. And um, the, senior, the senior guy got the, the, the single bunk and, uh, by himself, and then two other guys got top and bottom. So I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, the last one here, I got top and bottom. Two white guys, one from Iowa, and one from Texas. And they didn't want me in there. And they let me know from the jump. Uh, they did not like me being, but I had to, I had to go there. So we went, we went round and round about how we gonna clean, clean the spot up, and what we gonna do, and all like that. And they were working, but I hadn't been assigned or anything yet, so. They, they would leave early in the morning or whatever time they had to go to work because they work on the flight line. So, you know, tell them when you're going to go, when you're going to come back. So we had a lot of little arguments about how we're going to clean the spot up and all like that. And uh, got to a point where um, I, had to, I had to show off a little bit. And uh, I really didn't want to do it, but it, it happened. Um, The tag was on the door, and you know whatever your name was, so mine on the bottom, because I'm the last guy. There. So the, we had we had a what you call it, white glove inspection. Four, about five in the morning, me and I dress blues and everything. Colonels coming through, they wiping their fingers everywhere. And I spent I, we spent all night getting that spot ready, shining the floor and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, but when it was over with, uh, the door opened up, boom. Guy, he runs in there and he's, let's go to town, Brown, let's go to town. So I said, oh, what are you doing? He said, he looked at me like, what are you talking about? I said, you didn't knock on the door. You know, you open the door like you, like you got a license to come in there. So I tell him, I said, uh, you know, you're supposed to knock on the door and ask, can you come in? You know, he looked at me, yeah, like, looked like, yeah. So Brownie and the other guy, I can't think of his name, uh, he, he looked, they looked at me all cockeyed, kind of like, what am I doing, telling him, talking this way to them. So he didn't pay any attention. He walked right on by and just got the scuff on the floor. I spent all night long hand wiping this floor down with, with wax and all that to get it shiny so we could pass the inspection. He's scuffing the floor all up, and I got added to, oh, what are you doing, man? You just, they, what are you doing? So, he, um, he looked at me, he, he kind of big guy, about six to, about two, about two something. So, he, um, looked at me like, you want to try me? And, he, and what he did, he made a, a funny move. He put his hand in his pocket, his back pocket, when he was talking. Well, I'm from the city. That's that's telling him out to a, a thump. We gonna rumble. Right. 
So he looked at me like talking to me head, turned to the side. And I said, I got, I got hurt this guy or what? So now I work on the flight line, we have a jackknife. And it just so happened that the jackknife that I had, it was like strip wires and all that kind of stuff. It was like a, like a, like a Swiss knife, got five or six blades and all that kind of stuff. So I put it, I, it was in the drawer. So when he put his hand in his back pocket, started walking to me, I said, this dude, he's going to try to hurt me. So I go into the drawer, I pull out the knife, and I pull up, and I said, whoa, we can do this right now. I'm about this. And he looked at me, his eye got all big and everything. Oh, what's wrong? I said, let me tell you one thing. I said, I will hurt you, man. I said, I don't know who you think you're messing with. Oh, this guy's crazy. This guy's crazy. So I ended up, he said, we got to get out of here. So they ended up um, leaving. Now, now the words are running all over the backs. I'm going to hurt this guy and all this here. So Sergeant come to me and tell me he heard about it. And uh, I better watch myself. So I'm saying, Sergeant, you know, is, is that a threat? I mean, you know, is that a threat or what? I'm just telling you, watch yourself. So these little episodes that I went through all the time. Racism. So, yeah. yeah. It was, it was, it was uh, very, very outward. So, so what year did you get out of the... No, oh, I, I, I went in in 61, in uh, January 61, and uh, I mustered out in October 65. So you was tap dancing with Vietnam? I was supposed to go, but because I was short, every, my outfit was left right after I left. When I was going home, they were going to Vietnam. Uh -huh. So you come back 66? I come back, no, late 65. Late 65. Right. So, what was the climate like inside Philly? Uh, also, nationally, and where were you at as far as your mentality? Because now you're about 25. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm mad. I'm mad now. I got a kid and one on the way. Okay. Now, um, when I come home, I so what year did you get mad? I got married with 63, 64, something Okay, so you got married with an Air Force? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So when I come back, I'm come back. I hadn't been home in about two or three years, you know. Uh -huh. So now when I left, uh, I didn't see what I saw when I came back. I had to be on 52nd Street with my oldest brother. And um, I see all these guys slumped over. What's going, on? What's, going on? What's going on? He said, he laughed. He said, man, they drug addicts. I said, what? I went down with drugs and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So he said, uh, yeah, man, it's, it's the drugs. And I started looking around and I started seeing, I started seeing, uh, uh, like, it was, it was dark. It, it was dark, but I came, I came in, I came home in like October of uh, 65. So now, yeah, it's getting dark. It's right. dark. About five o'clock or so forth. I'm working, I'm working so forth. And um, I see all these people nodding and stumbling and tearing on. You know, I see little young girls out there standing on the corner, which was strange to be out there that, at night time. Right. When, I was, when I was a kid that age, he was, he was home. Right. It's just o'clock at night, it's dark. And uh, these little young girls, 12, 13 years old, they hanging out. I'm sorry, well, this is really a stark difference than what I left. Right. And uh, I want to revert back to my tenure in the military. Now, like uh, Saeed said uh, before, you know, when we grew up, we grew up in the 50s. So we knew about Brown versus Boy Education. We knew about the in the till thing. We know all about that. And there was a lot of activity beginning to de to develop in the black neighborhood because of those things. Right. People start coming, start coming out more. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was in, in the military, I got arrested in Georgia because I wanted to go up front to get some ice cream out of a Terry Queen. And they arrest me. And I was, I was uh, on leave with my, my, my roommate, named uh, Duncan. And the thing was, we were going to spend half our leave in uh, Georgia and the other half in Philly. But he had never been 
north, and I had never really been deep south. I'm in the southwest. It's mm -hmm. different. Right. So, uh, we decided to, to, one night after we had gone to a little clubbing, we decided to go get some, some ice cream. And you know, we pull into a Dairy Queen, about like 11.30, something like that. So we go in the front, and uh, they said, well, you got to go in the back. We go in the back, he's talking now. <laughs> you know, so, wow. so uh, while we were talking, we were trying to convince the, the, the two ladies that were uh, in charge of the, the, the spot. You know, you got to go in the back. He said, no, the law been passed. He said, we supposed to be able to go up front. So, next thing you know, here come the police. They jump out the cars, shotguns in the hand, oh, get against the wall, all this kind of stuff. What's going on? So they, they arrested us, took us to the to, uh, little city uh, uh, jail. And because we were in the military at that time, they, they got some uh, air police that came from uh, the, the air base there. So we got locked up. And then they cut us loose. And then we went to uh, the air base. On the way, the guy, one of the, one of the airmen was saying, man, you guys in trouble now, man. We heard all, what y'all was trying to do. And I'm like, well, what you hear? Well, I ain't going to talk about but you and George here. And you're going to get this, that, and the other. So when we finally go on the base, we go into uh, this office from this major. He face all broke up. Redhead guy, you know. He, he mm -hmm. tells us to uh, sit on the floor. Sit on the floor. So he said, I said, I want you to sit on the floor. He said, on the floor. He started talking about how he don't like what he heard and he understand we all serve the same president and the flag and all that kind of stuff. But he don't like what he heard. So we said, um, and he said, well, Major, you know, what is it that we got arrested for? No one ever talked to us. All we know is this message. He said, well, I heard that you guys we're propositioning those two white women. Ooh. Say propositioning white women. Say, all we trying to do is get some ice cream. We just came from from clubbing. We took two young ladies, two fine young ladies, to a little club, a little elk club, whatever it might have been. And all of a sudden, you trying now. We trying to proposition them old biddies. We like what twenty two, like that. And these women back in the sixties, talking about propositioning. So. He said, I don't like it. So we ended up being uh, held for about like, like a day or two and we went to court. Well, when we went to court, we ended up uh, uh, beating the case. But it was, it, it, the women did not call the cops. There was a little young guy that was in the back. I thought I saw somebody moving in the back of the, but I wasn't sure. He got scared and he called the cops. And he told them, well, I thought they were going to start some trouble. So at the end of the day, we ended up going to court and beat the case. Mm. And say, yeah, so the judge said, look, let me tell you something. I don't necessarily agree with it, but the law says they have a right to, to be served up front. You got to, you got to, you um, got to observe the law. And he said, well, where are you from? I said, I'm from Philly. He said, it's not a very good look on us. He said, because, you know, our Southerners, we uh, pride ourselves in, in Southern hospitality. He said, but uh, this is not a good example. He said, look, I'm going to tell you right now, you guys, you cops and all that, don't bring any more cases like this for me. So, so that was one time. Uh -huh. So we left and said, okay. So this helped form kind of a, a black nationalist type? Yeah. And, in, in right. Because uh, in, in the March of 63, I would have gone there if I could have got a lead. But they were booked up, I, you know, only some people could take a leave at the one okay. time, see. And rank has his privileges, and I tried my best to get a leave to go to Washington to join in. But uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't make it. Uh -huh. And then I demonstrated some, uh, in, in, in the town, a little town called Altus. You know, like six or seven of us, you know, you know we kind of like blazed the way. We decided one day we going to protest. And we, we was, um, he said in this, um, what we call it, um, a little cafe, we call it a cafe. 
First of all, we out of order for being in the, being in that period. Now we sitting down <laughs> on the counter and all like that, and people walking by looking. Sit-ins. Yeah, sit in. Right. And we stayed there for like about eight, about twelve o'clock that night. And brother, I never drank so much coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and ain't so many donuts and stuff. I, I, just, I just, I, we just decided to stay there. So finally, uh, they play, they closed the spot. And uh, you know, and then we demonstrated a couple more times, you know, here and there in the spot. So I'm, I'm. So when did you get into the the Black Panther Party? Well, actually, um, let me see. It was, it was it was so much going on in the sixties. You got you got to remember. Well, you couldn't remember, but um, in the sixties, when they called it the turbulent sixties, it was it, it was for real. It was so much energy. On both sides, whites and blacks, you had the, the a counterculture of the white guys wearing long hair. Right. They came out the hippie thing and went into the hippie thing. Right. Now back in the back in the day when Saeed and I were in high school, they had what they call uh, really like the birth of the cool. You remember? You remember Miles Davis had uh, had that piece called "Birth of the Cool." The birth of the cool was everybody dressed nice. And they had like a laid back attitude. We just, and we kids now, we're like 15, 16, 17 years old, but we acting grown. Mm -hmm. And everybody was that way. That's how everybody was, was uh, that way. You know, like what's called Joe College type thing. Uh -huh. Everybody was, yeah, you know, you, you wore your little cashmere, this if you could afford it, you know, Stacey Adams shoes, you know, lizards if you could buy, you know, everybody dressed nice. Right. Even in school, you know, everybody had a good appearance and so forth. Now, all of a sudden, in the 60s, you know, everybody has TVs now. So you can see things that you just read about right. or heard about over the radio. Now, all of a sudden now, uh, you're seeing groups like the uh, RAM, Revolutionary Army, Black Liberation Army, Deacons for Justice, Panthers, a thousand of the uh, Black Liberation Army. Then you had the counterculture, the white guys, SDS, and some other groups. They're fighting. The, they're fighting against their parents, right? Because they don't want to go to the Vietnam War, and they don't like the, cult, the culture that's that's happening with them. Blacks and Browns are looking for a better day, right? And that's what we're doing. You know, we want vote. We want to live where we got to live, and, and whatever, whatever. So a lot of energy is mm. jumping off. The thing about the 50s is that we were very disciplined. So it wasn't hard to transition into a group and participate because we were used to doing things by the numbers, so to speak. Like, like the like Shaker Sam, we, we had curfews and so forth. So when he said, go home, it was time to go home. Right. And let's go here, we go there. There wasn't no, no vacillation at all. So uh, my touching base with uh, one, one second, see you. One second. Ah, wow, next week. Yeah. Mm. Yes, everybody. We'll edit it. Okay. Okay. Now I think he has a little more on this side here. Yeah. Yeah, 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 something like that. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So what year did you um did you join the, the Black Panthers? Well, I mean, I'll tell you, um, that was sixty eight. Sixty eight. Somewhere around there. Sixty eight, sixty nine. Yeah, somewhere around there. So now it's sixty eight, sixty nine. The landscape of Philly's changed. You got the the heroin epi epidemic. Mm -hmm. You got the energy that's going on in the sixties. Right. So what was the the main reason? that you joined the, the Black Panthers? 
Well, I like the program that they uh, uh, had. Um, I think Saeed probably, because he was more, he was more closer to that group group of people than I was, because I was always working and moving around a lot. But he had a different hookup. And um, what I liked about it was we were trying to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, we we call it the. Uh, um, well, I, I used to sell the papers, and um, all the papers that I couldn't sell, I bought. So that would contribute. And also, I like the free breakfast program that they had. We used to go around different spots and ask people could they donate clothes, mm -hmm. could they donate uh, food or whatever the case might be for the free breakfast program and so forth. So um, I'm, I'm group oriented. I'm not in the business, I'm group oriented. So fitting into a group is my group, it's, it's my thing. I'm not, you know, like, well, even like in sports, I always play team sports. Right. I never played uh, single stuff. Right, individual sports. Right, I never always, I'm a team player, so to speak. So what I liked about it was the, the fact that uh, if, if you are going to hurt me, you're going to get hurt back. Right. See, all that uh, shuffling and hee 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 and yes sir and all the tap dancing, that not my style, never was. Uh -huh. See, so that fit right in with my personality. So who were some of your main influences? My main influences? Uh, during that era. Oh, I don't know, other than my, my dad and my uncles and so forth, you know. Now, outside of my family. Right, that's what I mean. Outside of my family, uh, let me see, we were talking about in the 60s. He said, who was jumping up and down then? Well, I kind of like, I kind of like what King was saying to a tour degree. Uh -huh. You know, and I definitely love Malcolm. Definitely, can't, I got to, I got to give him a shout out because uh, he was more in tune to my personality. Mm. You know, uh, he was a person that he, he spoke well, dressed well, act well, right? And he had a purpose, and, and everybody loved Malcolm. You know, if you had any substance about you, you had to love the man because he. He, he actually personified what a lot of people aspired to do and say, but didn't have the courage to do that. Mm -hmm. you know, he called a spade a spade. Right. And he went off and kind of like, ah, you know, that kind of stuff. And that's what I like about him. I would say those, those are two, the two main things. Right. But when, um, in the 60s and so forth, there were competing thoughts, school of thought, so to speak, in uh, the black neighborhood. You had the uh, Panthers and other groups and so forth that were uh, making their move. And then you had the Nation and so forth. And whichever way you went, that's what you, where you went. Those the two main groups. groups. Yeah, I'm, I'm more about activity. I, I like being involved in struggle. I like doing things. Community-based. Yeah.